Now, the Apollo as a ship and its fate often get overshadowed by its, um, history. That I'm gonna attempt to dance around, so give me a moment. Though the incident in question happened at the beginning of the 80s, the ship was actually launched in 1936. Originally, the Apollo wasn't called the Apollo. It was the MV Royal Scotsman, becoming the HMS Royal Scotsman. Yes, this was a Royal Navy ship. Though she was designed as a passenger ferry, when World War II happened, again, the UK did whatever they had to do, so she was converted into a troop carrier, seeing action in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy. The Royal Scotsman wasn't the largest ship ever, but it was 3,244 GRT, gross registered tons, and 340 feet long, or 100 meters. She was powered by twin diesel engines, and could hold roughly a thousand people on board, give or take. Now, after the war, she was returned to her original owners, Burns and Layard Lines, and was utilized for her original purpose as a simple ferry until 1967, when she was put up for sale and purchased by the Church of Scientology. Yeah, see, I told you this ship's history gets weird. Now, like I said, this part of the story kind of tends to overshadow what I really actually want to talk about, which is the whole train versus boat thing. So I'm going to sort of rush through the parts involving the Church of Scientology because, let's be real, that isn't what we do here. I try to avoid getting into religion and beliefs and cults and whatever you want to call Scientology. That's your opinion. Feel free to express it in the no man's land that we call the YouTube comment section. I will not question you on this particular subject. I am simply going through the actual history of this boat. And it was sold to the Church of Scientology to be used as the flagship for their Sea Org. Now, Sea Org is, well, a big topic on its own. But let's just say that L. Ron Hubbard was kind of trying to make his own country in the water. Like, you know, an organization on the sea. And it didn't really pan out so well when it came to actually being on the open ocean. Sea Org is technically still around. Again, beast of a topic, not going to touch it. Not what we do here. I talk about trains and planes and actual history, and I don't need to get into that. You know, that. We're gonna we're gonna dodge that bullet today. But when Sea Org in its original form did not pan out according to what L. Ron Hubbard wanted to do, and the church went ashore in Florida, the ship, which by that point had been renamed the MV Apollo, kind of wasn't useful at all. The thing about most vehicles is that if they're not being used to, like, move, then they just wind up burning a hole in the owner's pocket. Ships in particular are notorious for this, as unless you own the docks, and they didn't, you have to pay for renting the space for the ship to be docked, you have to pay to keep the ship up to par, you have to pay for the fuel to keep the ship fueled in case you have to move it. There's a whole ton of costs that go into maintaining a ship of this size, and they weren't using it. So it was kind of a waste of money. It would have been for anybody. So in 1977, the Apollo was sold for $90,000 to Consolidated Andy Incorporated, a shipbreaking firm located in Brownsville, Texas. It was expected that the Apollo would be brought to their docks and, well, scrapped. That's what shipbreaking firms do. But interestingly enough, that's not what happened, at least not immediately. Richard Jaros, who was the vice president of Consolidated Andy Inc., apparently took a liking to the Apollo. And I'm not going to question that, it was a nice looking boat, don't get me wrong. But he had the odd idea of turning it into a floating restaurant and relocating it to South Padre Island as kind of a tourist attraction. Now, this never came to fruition. Within a year, Consolidated Andy Incorporated actually resold the Apollo to a company called Zanzibar Shipping for $188,000, which means they flipped it for double their money in a year. So I think they kind of made up pretty well either way. At this point, the Apollo was rechristened the Arctic Star, which I actually kind of like. I like that name. It's a good name. I'll take it. It was under control by Zanzibar. Now, Zanzibar shipping is kind of a weird, shady corporation. According to court documents, they're a Panamanian corporation, which makes sense. But at that time, even though they said they did no business in the United States, they had headquarters in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. What? You know, I'm not even getting into this. How many times is this one ship going to go from shady organization to shady organization in this one story? Let's get to the train. The year was 1981. Middle of July. It's kind of hazy exactly what date. It's believed this happened on the 19th, but sources aren't consistent on this. So just to be safe, we'll say July 1981. 
the Arctic Star was actually still docked at Brownsville, Texas, for whatever reason, even though it had changed hands to Zanzibar by that point, and it was quite literally sitting, minding its own business. The Arctic Star hadn't hurt anybody, it hadn't done anything wrong, it was just chilling. And boy, it sure would be a shame if something came along and ruined that. Enter the Missouri Pacific 2199. This particular diesel electric locomotive was an EMD GP38-2. They were manufactured between 1972 and 1986. Over 2,000 have been produced, and most of them are still in service. But 2199, despite having an otherwise unnotable career, decided that would be a good day to do something unprecedented. And by that I mean it itself wouldn't actually do anything wrong as far as anybody can tell. I will tell you this, this locomotive did not strike the Arctic Star. That didn't happen. What did happen was that as 2199 was pulling a train of 18 fully loaded freight cars, seven of those cars broke away. Sources, again, are not clear why they broke away, though based on the fact that 2199 was moving at the time, I would bet money on a faulty coupler, or perhaps even an overloaded train. Additionally, 2199 was going uphill at the time. So seven fully loaded freight cars are now running away down a hill. This hill happens to end up at a turn that falls conveniently in line with where the Arctic Star was docked. Now you might be saying, well there's no way those cars could possibly reach the Arctic Star. I mean, it's on a dock, these are tracks. And true, but many railroads do have lines that are in spitting distance of ship docks. It just makes sense when it comes to loading and offloading goods. There was a concrete barrier in place specifically to prevent this kind of thing from being as dangerous as it turned out to be. But the uh, freight cars decided to jump the track, crash straight over that, and then plow through the Arctic Star. Not into, through the ship. According to Captain Robert Manning, who, <laughs> who I gotta say, definitely owns the role of being a ship's captain, he stepped out of the Arctic Star to find a train hanging out of the side of his ship. The cars had hit so hard that they penetrated the hull of the Arctic Star. Not only that, but they struck the stern. This resulted in the bow of the ship being forced into the dock, doing further damage, and twisting the hull, which, wow, I don't even want to talk about how much it would take to do that. Oh, it's probably worth mentioning that the ship was tethered to the dock with 9-inch polypropylene lines. Now, polypropylene is an extremely prevalent plastic product. It's in just too many things to name, but the reason for that is that it's extremely strong, and the impact snapped. Nine inch polypropylene lines. Now fortunately nobody was hurt, and like I said, 2199 hadn't actually hit anything, so it just kind of returned to service and pretended like it saw nothing. Zanzibar would take Missouri Pacific to court, and they would wind up having to pay nearly $300,000 in compensation for the destruction of the Arctic Star. And yes, the Arctic Star was not rebuilt. Its hull was bent. There was just no profit into fixing it at that point. So she was sent to another shipbreaking yard where she was finally broken up into pieces and sold for scrap. 2199 is now with Union Pacific, since they merged with Missouri Pacific in 1996, and as far as anyone's able to tell, she's still in service, so, uh, you know, that worked out. I don't think that diesel has done anything nearly this crazy since then, and I kinda hope it doesn't, because I hope this is the only time I ever have to talk about a train running away and slamming into a boat, because what stars aligned to cause this ridiculous accident? It's just fortunate nobody was hurt, and the only loss was a ship whose history was a lot more colorful than anyone would have expected. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.